today. Two execs from Sam Bankman Fried's crypto companies plead guilty. SBF himself is now back to the US. And macro investment strategist Lynn Alden discusses her outlook for crypto prices in the new year. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World. I'm Tanea McKeel. Crypto prices are mixed today. Bitcoin dropped once again, staying below the $17,000 level. Ether dropped to around $1,100 and Cardano rose to 25 cents. Okay, let's talk about the top stories. First, federal prosecutors announced that two of Sam Bankman Fried's former associates pleaded guilty to defrauding investors and are now cooperating with the government. Manhattan U.S. Attorney Damian Williams made the announcement last night. The Southern District of New York has filed charges against Caroline Ellison, the former CEO of Alameda Research, and Gary Wong, a co-founder of FTX, in connection with their roles in the frauds that contributed to FTX's collapse. Both Ms. Ellison and Mr. Wong have pled guilty to those charges, and they are both cooperating with the Southern District of New York. In the video, Williams reiterated his call for others involved in the alleged fraud to come forward as the investigation continues. The SEC and CFTC also announced charges against Ellison and Wong for their alleged roles in the multi-year scheme to defraud investors. A CFTC statement said the two accepted the claims made against them. The SEC said that Wong and Ellison had also accepted, quote, bifurcated settlements in connection with the complaints and are cooperating. A lawyer for Wong told us, quote, Gary has accepted responsibility for his actions and takes seriously his obligations as a cooperating witness. Allison's attorney did not immediately respond to our request for comment. Next up, the charges against Allison and Wong were announced the same night SBF was on his way from the Bahamas to New York, where he faces eight federal criminal charges. Williams also announced last night that SBF is now in FBI custody and will appear before a judge in the Southern District of New York as soon as possible. SBF has 48 hours from when he landed last night to appear in court for his initial hearing. As of noon Eastern, that has not happened. Last week, federal prosecutors charged SBF with stealing billions of dollars in FTX customer assets to plug losses at the crypto exchange's sister hedge fund, Alameda Research. Williams described the situation as, quote, one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. The former crypto billionaire has publicly acknowledged risk management failures at the exchange he founded, but he said he does not believe he has criminal liability. Nick Ackerman, a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, spoke with CNBC's Squawk on the Street this morning and said the cooperating witnesses are, quote, extremely important for the case. This was a very fast move by the government, no question about it. They really moved quickly. To get the two top insiders to basically cooperate is a huge, huge coup for the government. And I think it's just going to make the whole house of cards fall pretty quickly. Other people are going to realize that to avoid a really long jail sentence, uh, they're going to have to cooperate and give up other people. And finally, as FTX's collapse has rippled across the industry, the SEC is increasing the scrutiny of the work audit firms do for crypto companies. That's according to the Wall Street Journal, which cited a senior SEC official. In the interview with the journal, the regulator's acting chief accountant warned investors to be, quote, very wary of some of the claims that are being made by crypto companies. We've reached out to the SEC for comment, but as of noon Eastern, we hadn't heard back. FTX's implosion has impacted liquidity at companies with exposure to FTX and led to investigations by regulators around the world. Okay, for our main story, we turn back to crypto markets. I spoke with macro investment strategist Lynn Alden about her long-term bullish outlook for crypto and how the Fed's actions could impact markets in the coming months. Take a listen. So Lynn, you are bullish on Bitcoin and your work focuses heavily on the macro environment, which of course was very challenging in 2022. So from where you sit, what has this year been like for you? So for the most part, we're watching essentially the, the reverse of what we saw over 2020, 2021. So we had excess liquidity put into markets, uh, mostly on a worldwide basis. And now because of the inflation issues that were caused by that, as well as you know various physical constraints and problems like that, we're seeing a, rap a rapid withdrawal of that liquidity. And so essentially what we're seeing is central banks are, are doing their best to try to slow down demand um, uh, to try to take the edge off of some of the inflation pressures we see. And that's set to continue to probably at least uh, early 2023. And so obviously that's a very negative environment for most risk assets, especially things that um, have duration risk associated with them. So long duration bonds, uh, you know, unprofitable growth equities, things like that. Whereas, uh, you know, value equities and, and other types of assets have generally been more resilient. 
given the events of this year, would you say now, uh, you know, the end of the year is upon us, you more or less bullish on Bitcoin than you were at the start? Or is it kind of the same? Well, so at these beaten down levels, I'm quite bullish. And so the way I've been tracking it is that normally Bitcoin does very well in, in improving uh, liquidity environments uh, as well as just general risk on environments. So, for example, if you look at the macro, like the Purchasing Managers Index, for example, it's one of the best proxies we have for economic acceleration or deceleration. Most of Bitcoin's bull runs have been associated with that rising PMI environment, that rising liquidity environment, and most of the bear markets have been associated with 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 the you know the the drawdown in those things. And this one's been no different. And so you know for the, for the second half of 2021 and then most 2022, I've been kind of having two different minds about Bitcoin, which is essentially that I'm structurally bullish, the thesis is unchanged, but then in a cyclical sense, uh, people have to be concerned. And you know, some of these contagions, I think, were worse than than even I expected, even though I was concerned about some of them. So, for example, I didn't necessarily expect we'd see, you know, Bitcoin back, you know, below 20,000, for example, even though I expected kind of a, a choppy seas ahead. Uh, but now that we are back down to these beaten down levels, we've had a number of uh, blow ups in the, in the crypto space uh, more broadly. I'm actually pretty bullish on it here with, say, a three year view. Uh, but, you know, the, the caveat is that I, I, I'm still very uncertain around the next quarter, next two quarters, because we still have declining PMI environment. We still have kind of these, these general risk off conditions. We still have the Fed trying to tighten monetary policy, both with rates and with their balance sheet. And I don't think that's going to extend much past beyond the first half of next year. So I, I still think we have this window where we have to be kind of concerned. But I think that there is this is a really good accumulation point with, say, someone that has like a three year view on the on the asset, and the underlying fundamentals. What should investors be looking at and focusing on, whether that's a narrative or a theme or a data point or a price level? When you filter out all of the noise, what are you, Lynn, left looking at um, and what should investors be looking at? So as, as I previously, met, previously mentioned, one of the things I look at is the PMI, so the Purchasing Managers Index. Is the economy accelerating or, or uh, you know, accelerating or deceleration? Another one I look at for Bitcoin specifically, so a lot of people talk about it as like an inflation hedge, right? whereas if you look at the data, it actually, the, one of the best proxies for it is that it's a, a currency to basement hedge or a money supply inflation hedge, which is essentially that if you look at, say, global M2, global broad money, and then you denominate it in dollars, right? Because that's, that's the global unit of account for most uh, purposes. So if, even if you just look at, say, the top five jurisdictions, so for example, look at United States, you look at China, uh, you look at Japan, you look at the Euro area, uh, you can add the UK, you look at a number of these large, uh, you know, uh, uh, broad money supplies, you put them together and then denominate that in dollars. Generally, when that's rising, that's pretty good for Bitcoin. Basically, if, if the growth rate is rising, so, so basically more broad money is being created in dollar terms, which is either because they're all rapidly expanding their money supply or because the dollar is weakening compared to some of them. That's generally a very good environment for Bitcoin. Normally, Bitcoin's bull markets occur during that period. When you have a pullback in that or a stagnation in that uh, level, uh, especially in rate of change terms, normally that's pretty bad for Bitcoin. And that's actually what we saw throughout 2022. I think one thing we look forward to in 2023 is that probably the, the rate of change is going to resume again. Uh, with, with you know higher money supply growth, especially af in the second half of the year, I, I do still I do think there's still risk in the first half of the year, um, as you still see kind of this this you know just overall tightening pattern. And you know if we characterize 2022, it's mostly a story about valuations. So for example, er uh, corporate earnings have not collapsed, uh, unemployment has not spiked up yet. We see early signs of softening in some of these metrics, but there's been no rapid change. Uh, and so most of the carnage we saw in assets is just that their valuations are going down. So bond yields went up, uh, earnings, multiple sales revenues of, of different companies went down, and that pushed a lot of valuations down across the board, including for things like Bitcoin. Uh, whereas when we look out in 2023, I think it's going to be probably a different story, which is that I, I think earnings are more of the concern. For, for the broader uh, asset space. But I think that the that the overall kind of um, hardness of the dollar and the reduction valuations of some of these is not going to be the big story. And I think that gives assets like, say, gold or Bitcoin a chance to uh, potentially do better than we, what we see in, in, in the broad equity space, because it's I think that the, the weakness is probably more earnings related. What are the main trends that you're following in crypto for 2023 on the on the development and use cases side? So one thing I'm watching a lot is the development of the Lightning Network, uh, which is this, the layer on top of Bitcoin based on channels and fast, smaller payments. 
Um, that really took off over the past couple of years from a small base. It's had basically a, a pretty rapid growth rate just from a very small level. And it's become more and more usable over time. Basically, you, you have a higher rate of having larger payments go through smoothly. And I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of development still on the back end of that network, basically, you know, improving the infrastructure, finding all the optimizations for different trade-offs between, you know, custody versus reliability. And I think that's that's something that's being built a lot during this bear market that's going to be interesting. And it's actually, you know, the growth rate of the Lightning Network still held up pretty well considering the bear market that we're seeing. And so I think that's something to watch. Okay, that's all for Crypto World today, but we'll be back again tomorrow, so we'll see you then.